A couple quick things before we dive in. If you'd like to financially help believers like Bashara make disciples and plant churches among the unreached, we invite you to check out Pioneer's Co-Laborers campaign. You can find more information in our show notes at pioneers.org slash maverick. We're also really excited to announce that Bashara's story is being turned into a book with a much deeper dive into a lot of content we weren't able to cover in the podcast. Our listeners can sign up to receive a free digital copy of that book on our show notes page. Again, that's pioneers.org slash maverick. Okay, now on to the episode. The thing that caused the believers to increase was the miracles that the Lord gave me. His routine was he'd get up six o'clock in the morning, read the word, pray, get out the door, and he wouldn't come home until 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night. He was doing that every day, seven days a week, nonstop. You're listening to Maverick. I'm Sarah Lewis, and this is the final episode of Bashara's Story. Bashara's new stride didn't last long before he faced more opposition, because all that growth drew a lot of attention, specifically from the government, and Bashara quickly became a person of interest. He started to hear rumors about people poking around the neighborhood looking for him. He'd get weird calls and he'd see little things that were sort of suspicious. And then two armed men knocked on his door. When he answered and they told him they were looking for a guy named Bashara, he played dumb. They said, we want a man. His name is Bishara. He sleeps here. He rents here. He's a person of religion. I said to them, we don't know of him here. They asked me more questions and I said, no, not here. Go ask further along the way. So even though they were talking to Bashara the whole time, he convinced them that they were at the wrong house, talking to the wrong guy. He had a few close calls like this here and there. And then one evening, he and Dan and Ryan were meeting. Usually after their meetings, they would walk out the front door together. But Bashara just had this feeling that they should separate. So he went out the back door instead. And there was a car waiting there for him. He got picked up by like... Uh local security forces, and um, the government there could not believe that there would be any reason for this many Muslims to become Christians. They, they could not wrap their mind around. So they were convinced that there was a bunch of money changing hands in order to convince these Muslims to say that they were Christians, which, of course, was never happening. And uh, Bashada, he laid the story out there. And when they said, you know, who's leading you? Who, who are you working for? He said, I'm a messenger of God. I, I tell stories about Jesus and I teach people the Bible. And that's it. They interrogated him for hours, using a lie detector, making threats, offering bribes. They really wanted Bashar to give up Dan and Ryan. They wanted to find the foreigners that were persuading Bashar to do what he was doing. And no matter what they tried, they couldn't get anything out of him except the gospel. Their main concern was that there was so much conflict that was connected to this movement of many, many Muslims who had walked away from Islam and who were now being led and discipled through a network that Bashada was organizing in the city, and they just couldn't wrap their mind around it, that that could actually be a, you know, a real thing. But it was, and I think eventually they figured that out too. Eventually they decided to let him go and Bashar went right back to the same rhythm of evangelism and discipleship. And that's when things started to get weird with his dad. I still remember that. Um, this was the hot season. There was no power in our house. Um, so my family and I we were trying to get some sleep up on the roof uh, where we could get a little bit of a breeze. And I'm trying to go to sleep. And, you know, 10 or 11 at night, I get this text message from Bashar saying, my dad's asking these questions, and it doesn't seem right. His dad had started to get pretty inquisitive. He kept asking Bashara for information about Dan. You know, what's his number? Where does he live? What's his family like? That sort of thing. And Bashara had an uneasy feeling about it. And, you know, was started to, to, to wonder about his dad. Why would he, why would he even want that? Um, 
pretty quickly from then, it kind of, all of a sudden, he found out that, that people were out to look for him. And after his strange conversations with his dad, he got a call from a girl he didn't know. It was a short conversation. She told him to hide quickly, and she hung up. It was this girl who was a family member and heard these, these talks within the extended family that they were coming to get Bishara because of his faith. And she was the one, I think, that tipped him off to let him know about what was coming his way. So that at that point, he went into hiding and through this contact found out that his dad was behind it all. And over the next few days, things started to become more clear. What Bashara learned was that his dad had been pretending to love Jesus in order to get Bashara close, gather information, and eventually finish the job he set out to do in the first place, kill his son. He figured out where Bashara was living, put a bounty on his head, and a manhunt began. My father was paying many people to hunt me. He left all of his work and every other destruction. He only wanted to capture and kill me. He was really keen not to ask the new believers to stay with them. He really didn't want to put anyone in danger. And so he was on the outskirts of town in this really just simple dwelling with somebody that he didn't really know. It was just really an unideal situation. He said he was in this room with two other guys. It was really small. It was hot, cramped. They were smoking a lot. And he was just like miserable, you know? There were hundred people searching for me. Every one of them wanted to be the one to find me. I was very afraid. Bashara stayed in that little room on the outskirts of town for five long, miserable days. And during his time there, he had another vision. And all of a sudden, the room transformed. It got really wide. It got really bright. The, the roof came off, and he could see, he could kind of see the heavens. And, and I, I believe it, if I recall right, it was like things kind of turned golden, um, almost like these descriptions that John has in the book of Revelation. You know, you're trying to put a name on on these qualities that don't exactly exist yet on Earth. And those were the kinds of things that he was describing. And in that vision, God comforted Bashara. He told him not to worry and that he was going to make a way of escape for him, that he still had many things he wanted to do in Bashara's life. And Bashara didn't know how this whole thing would end but he believed that God would rescue him once again. So he had been there for four or five days, I want to say, and that's when he contacted me and he's like, I really can't stay here anymore. So he came to my house and, you know, over a cold glass of water and some peanuts, he he was telling me this story. And then, and we both knew it wasn't a safe place for him to be. So we got him to another place. It was a little bit spy movie-esque, you know, like he was in the back seat, he was down on the floorboard, and you go through security training, but this was like one of the few times I actually looked all around to see if someone was telling me, because uh, if his dad did find out where we lived, I was pretty sure that he would send someone to our house as well. It was this really bizarre thing where in the movies you see this happen pretty commonplace and that's exactly what it was like. So Dan got Bashara to another safe house where he sat waiting and wondering how God was going to deliver him from this situation. His dad had a guy organizing the search and in addition to offering a finder's reward he would pay people every day to hunt Bashara. Morning and night they were looking for me They would meet in the morning and receive their money. Then they would spend the day looking for me. With a bunch of people walking the streets, with no other objective than to find Bashara and kill him, you'd think Bashara would start to doubt that vision he got. These guys were organized, well-supplied, and very strategic. Hiding out in a room like a sitting duck, relying on info from a young girl he doesn't even know, and trusting people not to turn him in, 
That doesn't seem like a recipe for making it out alive. But then again, God tends to do things despite what seems like good strategy. He once called his people to march around a city seven times and then blow trumpets as a tactic to defeat the opposing army. I mean, the gospel itself is a message of conquering death by dying. And Bashar's whole story is God making one seemingly unstrategic move after another. He used a short-term worker who didn't know the language or culture. He started this movement with Bashara, who had no social influence or relationships because he was just visiting from out of town. He brought together workers from different missions organizations with different traditions and made them the people who would pour into Bashara together. He started house churches made up of Catholics and Muslims and pagans, and even people who couldn't speak the same languages. He spread the gospel through opposition to the gospel. In this line of work, you know, we talk about strategy a lot. We know we want to be intentional and that kind of thing. And it's really just testimony, like the Lord is going to do what he wants to do, and he can use whoever he wants, whatever way he wants to do it, and his kingdom will advance the way that he wants it. And it's our job to try to be sensitive to his leading, even when it doesn't make sense to us. So that's the one of the things I love most about it, is that it, on paper, it didn't make sense. It didn't seem likely. It shouldn't have happened, and yet it did. And so even though it seemed like the odds were stacked against him, and even though it was scary to sit in that position, Bashar was also aware that God can give a whole city to a handful of people with trumpets who are willing to trust him. And God had told Bashar he would deliver him. And Bashar was going to trust that, even though things were going to get harder before they got better. Because a few days after Bashar got to that new safe house, his dad suddenly fell into a coma. And instead of calming down, things really ramped up. People suspected that Bashara had put some sort of curse on his dad, and there was a bigger urgency to finding Bashara. The military was enlisted to help, and the search was expanded. By that time, over 100 people were patrolling the streets, going door to door looking for him. And then, his dad died, and everything changed. And so, as these things often do in, in that part of the world, there was financial backing and so a lot of incentive to look for him. And then when Bashar's dad died, all of a sudden, that money stopped. And then people had no financial interest in looking for him anymore. And then with time, um, you know, things kind of calmed down. And the girl that was helping him, who was on the inside, when she was seeing that people were giving up, they were going back to their normal routines in life, she was relaying that back to Bishar and that he had been in hiding for three weeks. And he said, okay, enough is enough and I'm going back to my life as well. But for Bashara, getting back to his life is such a different reality than for most of us. Bashara doesn't live a life of rest. He leaves home looking over his shoulder. Even after his dad's death, he still has people looking for him. Not long ago, Bashara was driving his motorcycle on an empty street, and all of a sudden, another motorcyclist came racing up behind him, drove him off the road, and beat him. He would have beat him to death, but in the process of driving Bashara off the road, the guy injured himself, and Bashara managed to get away. Then there was the day that Bashara met a young boy who asked him for a Bible. When Bashara connected with him to give him one, it ended up being a setup, and he was thrown in jail for a while. And there was the time when his siblings invited Bashar to come over, have dinner, and settle their inheritance. When they begged him to leave Christianity and he refused, they officially wrote him out of the will. And although he walked away with nothing, he wouldn't have walked away at all if one of the helpers in the kitchen hadn't warned Bashar that his food was poisoned and he knew not to eat it. Bashar has been in and out of prison like it's a hobby. He's been threatened and beaten and interrogated more times than he can count. Around every corner, people lie and manipulate and seek to kill him. I've been doing this stuff since I was 23 years old, and I've never been in a situation where, I mean, when we would meet with people, we just, it, we really did not know if it was gonna be the last time that we would ever see them again. 
Bashara never knows which encounter will lead to someone's salvation or his demise. And you can tell when you talk to him that it's really hard. It chips away at him. He talks about how exhausting it is and the ways it's messing with his trust in people. He talks about wanting to find a wife and raise kids, maybe buy some farmland and settle down. And he really doubts whether that life is ever going to be a possibility for him. But in the same conversations, Bashar is quick to say that through it all, he's learned to trust God alone. He's discovered what it means to find your life through losing it. And he doesn't think of himself as unfortunate. In fact, he feels really blessed. I think our our proclivity is to feel sorry for a person like Bishara, that he has to go through that, and then thankful that we don't. And the reality is the Bible says, no, you don't need to feel sorry for him. He is storing up treasures in heaven that we're going to know nothing about once we get there. And that's where we risk missing it. To hear a story like Bashara's and to walk away thinking that we're the ones that are blessed is to miss that point entirely. Maybe it's people like us who should be jealous of people like Bashara. Maybe in our lack of suffering, we're actually sacrificing more than we realize. And what does that mean? What are the implications in my life, living in a context probably where so much of the culture says, be safe, be comfortable, Don't do that. That's messed up. That's wrong to put yourself in a situation like that. That's irresponsible. There's not like a more risk adverse culture in the world, I don't think, than American culture. The word and these Christian lives just go against the grain of that so, so hard. And in Hebrews chapter 11 or 12, it gives us that response. It talks about people like Bashara, of whom the world are not worthy in chapter 11. And people, they go around having to wear animal skins, living in caves. People that we would say, Lord, bless those people, help them, and thank you for the freedoms and the good stuff that we have here. But that's not what the Bible tells us and how to respond. It says in chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The ultimate example is Jesus, right? Do we feel sorry for Jesus because he endured the cross? No, that's not the point of the cross. And it's easy to get short-sighted and want to avoid persecution or feel sorry for a guy like Bishara, but the reality is he's following these steps of Christ. Just like Jesus endured the cross, just like Paul endured suffering of many kinds, The fruit of that is exponential. So if anybody should be envious, I think in a lot of ways, it should be us. So how do you wrap up a story that's still unfolding? How do you tie a nice bow on someone's life? I really wrestled with where to leave this whole thing. And I felt like the best thing to do was to give Bashara the last word. So I asked him what he wanted to say, what he hoped people would walk away with from his story. And he said he wanted to pray. So if you've been following along with his story, if you've been listening and wrestling, this is Bashara's prayer for you. God, who is over our hearts, let your will be done. We believe in the things we don't see. Your path is hard, but it leads to salvation. In America, in Africa, In Asia, in Europe, open their hearts. You are Emmanuel. You are with us in hardships and in joy. Put in our heart encouragement and take from our hearts sadness. The people who are sick, weak, laying in their beds, heal them and let them get up. Oh Lord Jesus, we have believed in you and we will never turn back. Give us strength from you. Amen.
Bashara actually had a lot more to say. He gives this incredible exhortation to those who have followed his story. So we've included a transcription of it in the show notes. Also, if you're curious about the lyrics to that last song, you can find them there as well.